Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, How We Can Support Women and Families by Repealing the State TANF Family Cap. I'm Amanda Hooper, Director of Engagement and Mobilization at the National Women's Law Center, and I'll be your moderator for today. We have just a few technical notes before we begin the presentation. Um, first, all lines will be on mute during today's webinar. We will be taking questions after the presentations are finished, but you can submit questions throughout the webinar by typing it into the designated area on your control panel and hitting send. Please also note that we'll be recording the webinar and you will receive a link to the recording of the presentation as well as um, to the PowerPoint slides within the next few days. We will be hearing from a fantastic panel of experts today. Our speakers include Elizabeth Lowerbash from the Center for Law and Social Policy, Jill Adams from the Center on Reproductive Rights and Justice at the University of California, Berkeley, Anna Chu and Jillian Edmonds from the National Women's Law Center, um, Allison Weir from the National Diaper Bank, and last but not least, Jessica Barcelo from the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Um, also, if you want to tweet along with us during the webinar, we are using the hashtag EndTANFCAPS, and you can also see that hashtag in your webinar toolbar. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to our first speaker, Elizabeth, take it away. Okay, do I have, here we go, show my screen. Thanks so much, and I'm going to go fairly quickly since we do have this fabulous panel of speakers, and I'm just going to provide a little bit of context about what is TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and how the family cap that we're going to be talking about today fits into the overall picture. So TANF, uh, people mean two different things often by TANF. One is the block grant. It is a federal funding stream. But in, for this purposes, we're mostly going to be talking about cash assistance, which families, very low income families, can receive under TANF. And the family cap is a policy that affects families receiving cash assistance. So just some context. TANF is an inherently two-generational program because it is targeted to low-income families with children. Uh, those are the families who can receive cash assistance under TANF. When we say two-generational strategies, what we mean by that is that it takes into account that parents are very important to children, um, both as nurturers, as caregivers, and as breadwinners or providers, and also that children are really important in parents' lives, that they motivate parents, um, but also that parenting is one of the very important roles for young parents, parents of young children. And so when they're torn between these different roles as nurturers and providers, it really pulls parents in multiple directions. Um, so in theory, TANF, because it is such a very flexible funding stream, can make a big difference and has an in families' lives. Families can get cash assistance are supposed to do work activities that will help them achieve economic security in the long term. The children and the families can receive child care, and states can use this flexible funding to provide wraparound services that lead to families having more money and better child outcomes. In practice, however, this is often not what happens. Only a very small and decreasing share of the families, the low-income families who could benefit from kind of cash assistance, receive it, um, both because of stringent eligibility requirements and because uh, most states have work requirements, even for families with very young children, that can interfere with their caregiving responsibilities, and parents of children can find it hard to reach uh, to meet those requirements and therefore to receive cash assistance. And you can see that even in the recession uh, in recent years, as the number of families with children in poverty climbed, the number of families receiving cash assistance was pretty much stuck. Um, again, because TANF is a block grant, um, 
states do not receive more funds if they have to serve more families. So states are pushed into really bad trade-offs um, at times of need, such as the recession. Um, many states were reluctant to allow the kind of case loans to rise. And States have a great deal of flexibility under TANF to set the policies. And as we'll learn, one of the policies that states are setting is this extremely harmful policy, the family cap, which denies assistance to families who have um, an increase in assistance to families who have a child while they're getting cash assistance. And I highlight this because at this political moment, um, Obviously, block grants are in the conversation a lot for other programs as well. And so by looking at the challenges of TANF, it can be a warning for other programs. Um, the cash, the block grant, as we talked about under TANF, um, is going to more and more different areas. It sort of flows through states' budgets. Um, and less and less of it is going to the families who need assistance. Currently, only about less than a quarter of TANF spending is in the form of cash assistance. Um, and less than half is even if you put together cash assistance, child care, and work-related activities. So this, again, is one of the dangers of block grants. Um, and it's one of the reasons that it becomes hard to fix um, damaging policies by letting more families receive assistance, because states have a fixed allotment of funds and would have to pull funds out of other activities, which is always a challenging political conversation. Um, so in practice, as I said, while TANF is this great opportunity for low-income family, or in theory, it's a great opportunity, in practice, mostly that opportunity is missed. Um, while it's a flexible funding stream, the opportunity to provide individualized services rarely is lived up to. It's often a one-size-fits-all program. Um, families might have access to child care, but it's often not very high quality. Again, the work requirements tend to be work-first programs rather than ones that lead to long-term economic security. This is very much a brief overview of TANF, but I do want to let the other panelists fly, um, speak. And I just want to just flag before moving on how young most TANF adults are. Um, half of TANF adults are uh, 29 or under. Many of them have young children. And this is a key developmental moment for families. So we can and should do better. And my fellow panelists will tell you how one of the ways that we could do so. I'm sorry, I missed my own slides. I just wanted to point out the high level of variation across states in their state policies. And um, in particular, some states have family cap and some do not. I have a little exclamation point here for California because when I first made this slide, it was a yes. But due to many people's efforts, that has been fixed. Thank you. Um, I'll let my colleague speak. Great. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, at this point, we are going to turn the floor over to um, Jill. So um, Jill, please take it away. OK, thank you. Welfare family caps are state policies that prohibit TANF grant increases to families that bear children while already receiving cash aid. These policies are rooted in racist, classist, sexist ideology about which members of society do or do not deserve to bear children. Family caps have been manifestly unsuccessful and harmful to families already struggling to get by. Nevertheless, they remain on the books in 17 states. You can go ahead and, and advance the slide. Thanks. The stage was set for welfare family caps several decades before their enactment. In the 1960s, welfare rights advocacy, relaxing cultural mores, increasing divorce rates, and demographic shifts combined to make more female heads of household and more African Americans eligible for welfare. For example, before the war on poverty, the federal caseload had been 86% white. By 1967, 
it was only 54% white. These shifts did not go unnoticed by welfare critics. In the, 19, or the 1970s ushered in the trope of the welfare queen. Although this phrase was coined to describe Linda Taylor, who allegedly used as many as 80 aliases to receive cash assistance through fraudulent means, politicians later co-opted the term welfare queen to describe any mother, particularly any African American mother, who relied upon cash aid. For example, during Ronald Reagan's 1976 presidential bid, he described Taylor's welfare fraud as an epidemic of abuse of the federal benefits system, rather than the aberrant anecdote that it truly was. In the 1980s, conservative think tanks developed the underclass theory, version of the culture on poverty view. The underclass theory argued that African-American female-headed families socialized children into a lifetime of, quote, welfare dependency, school failure, addiction, extramarital sexual activity, and adolescent pregnancy crime and alienation from mainstream society, end quote. Despite the fact that the numbers of white women and black women on welfare were pretty much equal, conservative commentary on poverty and government assistance concentrated almost solely on African-American mothers. By the 1990s, people were fed up with what they perceived to be a defunct and dysfunctional system. The majority of the American public equated welfare with black female degeneracy. Democrats and Republicans alike demanded change. And in 1991, during a, a presidential campaign speech, Bill Clinton vowed to, quote, put an end to welfare as we know it. In 1992, just one year after he said that, New Jersey became the first state to adopt a welfare family cap, ending its policy of increasing benefits by $64 a month when, the, when um, a new child was born. Two years later, Arkansas became the next state to adopt such a policy. At the time, states had to secure federal permission to adopt these policies. But in 1996, then-President Clinton made good on his campaign promise by signing into law the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, which ushered in temporary assistance for needy families uh, that Elizabeth so helpfully explained, and with it, the invitation for states to maintain or enact welfare family cap policies now without federal oversight. Kansas had decided not to reauthorize its program after these reforms were passed, concluding the restrictions on welfare reform were sufficient to ensure families transition off welfare in a timely fashion. Unlike Kansas, 24 other states maintained or adopted some form of a family cap by the turn of the century. And to complete our timeline here, in 2002, Maryland became the first state to repeal its welfare family cap, starting a new era for these policies. Moving on to the next slide, a trifold set of inaccurate assumptions about welfare recipients commonly underlies family caps. All are embedded in the notion that childbearing motivations of low-income parents are fundamentally driven by financial interests. First, the first assumption is that welfare recipients are thought to have large families though they bear the same number of children on average as parents in the general population. Second, cash aid is assumed to incentivize childbearing. Not so. Numerous studies have demonstrated that family caps do not, in fact, disincentivize childbearing or lower birth rates because cash aid doesn't incentivize childbearing in the first place. Furthermore, a ver various personal values, familial conditions, and structural factors influence people of all income levels in considering whether to bear children. Not everyone at any income level, level is building uh, a family according to carefully laid plans based on rational actor theory. It's messier than that for most of us. In fact, approximately one half of pregnancies in the U.S. are unintended. Women living in poverty experience unintended pregnancy at a rate five times higher than do women at the highest income level. And abortion rates are also higher among pregnant people living in poverty. The single study to find a correlation between family caps and lowered birth rates only established the links in the minority of states that use Medicaid funds to cover abortion. This makes sense because a poor pregnant person who cannot afford to pay the cost of a child excluded from cash assistance may not be able to afford the out-of-pocket cost for an abortion either. Approximately a quarter of pregnant people insured by Medicaid who seek but cannot afford an abortion will carry the pregnancy to term, and they are far more likely to live in poverty than their similarly situated peers who were able to secure abortion care. The last assumption, 
Lawmakers adopting these policies have suggested that cash aid makes marriage less appealing. If welfare truly disincentivized marriage and incentivized births that would otherwise not have occurred, one would expect to see higher birth rates and more children born to unmarried people in states with more generous cash assistance allowances during this period. Instead, states with more meager grants before passage of so-called welfare reform in 1996 tended to have higher rates of childbearing to unmarried mothers. Moving on to the next slide. If these faulty assumptions are the pillars of family caps, then the foundation of family caps is population control. That is the belief that certain groups of people have children irresponsibly or are unfit to parent and therefore must have their re reproduction controlled by authorities. This is a long-standing mindset in the U.S. that has had devastating results. Some scholars have likened family caps to the eugenic sterilization efforts of the 20th century that targeted people living in poverty, those with disabilities, unmarried mothers, and disfavored racial minorities and immigrants. Author Eric F. McBurney wrote, the family cap rule evolved from America's eugenic laws that once forced sterilization upon its presumed inferior and therefore reproductively unfit population. Next slide. As this sort of criticism of family caps mounted around the turn of the century, advocates began to agitate for repeal of the failed policies through legislative and budgetary advocacy as well as legal challenges. Since then, seven states have eliminated their family caps. We're talking about such bastions of liberal ideology as Oklahoma and Nebraska, for example. Four other states have considered repealing their policies. Uh, we chronicle legal challenges and repeal efforts in 11 states in a report that the National Women's Law Center has um, offered to share with the webinar participants today. Moving on, um, just to highlight a couple of the states uh, that have repealed. Minnesota is among them. Um, there in Minnesota, a broad-based coalition of organizations supported the effort, motivated by an array of values-based concerns. The primary motivation for advocates fighting for repeal, though, was the policy's failure to affect birth rates while adding financial strain to families living in poverty. One of the findings in the report I mentioned earlier is the need for perseverance in advocacy. Introducing bills several years in a row may allow a repeal campaign to build enough visibility and momentum to garner adequate support from the public, the media, and elected officials. For example, New Jersey advocates have attempted to repeal its family cap through legislative advocacy and litigation on and off since 1998. Similarly, in California, which Jess will be discussing shortly, legislators introduced five bills to limit or eliminate their state's family cap between 2007 and 2015. And then finally in 2016, the policy was repealed through the budget approval process. Next slide. So repeal efforts have forced the overdue and often neglected conversation about racism, sexism, and classism in social programs and welfare po policy. And it's forced this conversation in the media, in state houses, and in the general public. Impacted parents have courageously told their stories of struggle and resilience under the caps. These powerful self-advocates, by having shared the wisdom of their lived experiences, have debunked many misconceptions about public program participants, changed opinions, and touched the hearts of many elected officials. Bill, are you there? This is Jessica Barthlow, and I can't hear Jill either. She's disappeared. Um, I'm wondering if um, Jill's audio may have gotten momentarily disconnected. Um, it, so it says she's calling back in now. Um, so thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. And Jill should be back on the line um, momentarily. Um, I can talk if you want. I can talk uh, briefly about this map. Um, this is a map that, that was produced uh, by Jill's organization. Are you back? I'm back. Thanks, okay. Jess. Okay, great. Come on back. I was just going to talk about the, this great map. But you, thank Jill, you, did you want to be on this 
Did you want to be on this slide or the previous slide? The map's the perfect slide, and I, it is my uh, last slide. Okay, Thank great. you. So where do we stand today? Thanks to the work of impacted families, advocates, and elected officials, seven states, as I've mentioned, have repealed their welfare family caps. But there are still 17 states with some form of a welfare cap still in place. As you can see from this map, hopefully you can see, there are a variety of different types of caps that operate in different ways. But they all have the same effect. Children born into capped families face increased risks for homelessness, health problems, and other hardships associated with extreme poverty. These caps are offensive, ineffectual, and harmful. Available data show that family caps do not support the goals of the very cash assistance programs they modify. Because these caps do not ameliorate the effects of poverty on children and instead exacerbate child poverty and its repercussions. By focusing on the personal behaviors of mostly young, unmarried mothers, family caps divert attention away from the real structural sources of inequality and poverty in this nation. And we hope that advocates throughout this country, hopefully some on the call today, will forge ahead on the path toward abolition of these heinous and punitive policies. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, and at this point, um, Anna and Jillian, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you, Elizabeth and Jill. That was very informative. We wanted to just take this opportunity to dig a little bit deeper, deeper into how family caps impact women and families. You know, as we've all heard, family caps would make an already hard situation for families even worse. You know, as it stands, the current TANF family TANF benefits are insufficient to support families, and in real terms, TANF family caps are. TANF benefits are actually worth less today than they were worth in 1996. In 96, a family of three receives, received an average of $377 in TANF cash assistance. Today, that amount is $432. You know, but if the TANF cash assistance had kept place with inflation since 1996, the average amount of benefits would actually be $577. That's $145 higher than the current average amount of benefits now. And the amount of benefits is actually so low so that in every so that in every state the fa the TANF family benefits for a family of three were actually below 50% of the federal poverty line, which is considered deep poverty. And TANF benefits are not only worth less today after considering inflation, but far fewer families are actually receiving the benefits. In, 90, in 1996, 68 out of 100 poor families with children received TANF benefits. In 2014, that figure is only 23 out of 100. It's critical to keep in uh, to keep this in mind when considering both the impact of the TANF family cap, you know, and considering the cost of a newborn child. So taking care of an infant is both expensive and extremely time consuming, making it difficult for a parent to actually go back to work after the birth of their child. And if a family is subject to family cap, then what they have to do is they actually have to make that same TANF check stretch even further to cover a newborn. And although an increase in benefits by repealing the cap may not cover the entire cost of having a child, it would help families that are already struggling. And so one example of how expensive infants can be you know, and what the real day-to-day -day balancing at the families have to do is to look at the cost of diapers. And we have Allison from the National Diaper Bank Network here to talk about the high cost of diapers and how much of a person's kind of cash assistance might need to be set aside for diapers. Thank you, Anna. As Elizabeth knows, there's a lot of variability between the states as to how they affect TANF, including the, the, the monthly allowance for a family of three. So what we have here are the, the various uh, states with the family cap and how much each state provides monthly for a family of three. Diapers are undeniably a necessity for babies, and they're a recurring necessity, costing about $80 a month. As you can see on the second line, that $80 a month can eat up a lot of the, the monthly allowance from the, um, for cash assistance. But if you add a second child, that amount even doubles. So the point in Mississippi that if you're to adequately diaper two children on the cash for families, uh, cash assistance for um, 
a family of three, you've eaten 94 percent of that cash assistance just in diapers alone. Even the, the, um, the more generous states, it's still a significant portion of the, the cash assistance is dedicated entirely to diapers. And I'll pass this back on to, to Anna. Thank you. This is actually Jillian. But thank Sorry. you, Allison. Um, no, that's that's fine. Thank you for that illustrative example of how um, families can be hurt by family caps and how difficult it can be to afford the necessities for a newborn using those cap TANF benefits. As we've seen, family caps lead to deeper poverty and hurt families. A family in poverty turns to TANF to help them make ends meet and to care for their children. When family planning services are not available or are too expensive, women in poverty are more likely to experience an unintended pregnancy. Some women may also choose to become pregnant for many other reasons. Regardless of if the new baby was planned or unplanned, the family's benefits are capped and they are going to receive no additional money for their newborn. This forces them to stretch their TANF dollars, which already did not list them out of poverty, to pay for a new child as well. And this family then experiences even deeper poverty, and this downward trend that we see here becomes cyclical when we look at it across generations, because the long-term effects of poverty are often devastating for children. The long-term effects of poverty, which are shown here in this uh, image, are especially pronounced for young children. The younger a child is when their family experience po experiences poverty, the more that experience will affect them throughout their lifetime. This is a result of toxic stress, fewer opportunities, and potentially less nutrition. Uh, deeper poverty tends to affect children even more. Children raised in poverty also have lower earnings and lower work productivity as an adult. They are more likely to commit crimes as an adult. They are more likely to need a special education program when they are in school, and they are more likely to have health problems for their entire life than a child who is not raised in poverty. One study found that family caps increase the deep poverty rate of children of single mothers by over 13 percent. So children whose families are capped tend to grow up in even deeper poverty than other children and are therefore more affected by poverty. Before California repealed its family cap, a study was done that sh with 2,000 women that indicated that families were impacted by the cap and they were less stable for every parameter that was studied. The cycle of poverty continues into adulthood, making children who grow up in severe poverty due to family caps more likely to live in poverty as an adult. The poverty experience when a family has a capped child is frequently exacerbated by laws that further restrict reproductive health choices or that do not create family-friendly workplaces. This map was created by the National Women's Law Center to illustrate some of the, the intersections between these laws. Can of family caps, we already know, are anti-family and anti-woman. They do not allow women to make the best decision for themselves about whether to have a child. But many of the states that have TANF family caps also have other policies that fail to support women and families and fail to ensure their economic security. This map provides a short description of each state's family cap law, as well as information on access to health care, including contraception and abortion, and the economic landscape for families. It is interactive and available on the National Women's Law Center website. The link will be available at the end of the, at the, end of the PowerPoint. If you roll over each state on the map, it provides a brief description of the type of family cap that state has, as well as an overview of some of their policies relating to reproductive health and workplace fairness. In this example, Arkansas has a family cap that denies any increase in cash assistance to a family that has a child while receiving TANF funds. While they have expanded Medicaid under the ACA, Arkansas has other policies that prevent women from accessing reproductive health care or don't help them earn a secure income that enables them to raise a family. They have not expanded Medicaid family planning services, and they do not allow public or private insurance coverage of abortion, making it harder for women to access reproductive health care. Access to reproductive health care is crucial, crucial for people to be able to plan their families and to have healthy pregnancies when they choose to have children. 
Arkansas also permits some unfair and discriminatory workplace practices that make it harder for pregnant women and mothers to enter and remain in the workplace. They do not have a pregnancy accommodations law, which would require employers to make reasonable accommodations for medical needs arising out of a pregnancy so that pregnant women can continue to do their jobs and have a healthy pregnancy. This includes things such as being able to have a water bottle while at work or sitting down while operating a cash register. They also do not have a fair scheduling law, which requires employers to give their employees advance notice of their schedules the right to a change in their schedules without a fear of retaliation, and the, these laws also limit last-minute schedule changes. These laws make it easier for parents to schedule their child care because their work schedule is predictable, and that also makes their income more predictable, which makes it easier for them to budget their limited income. So as you can see, all of these policies interact in ways that hurt women and families, and low-income families that are subject to subjected to TANF family caps have a wor even worse experience because of these laws. Thank you so much, Jillian. We, you know, uh, this was, I, we hope this was all very helpful information for you all, but we also wanted to note that not all is bleak and dreary in this world. Instead, I think the recent years have shown that there's a real opportunity on this issue. And we have on with us today Jessica Bartholo, who worked in depth and intensely in California to repeal the cap. He, she was successful in bringing together a wide coalition of activists uh, who rallied behind this and defeated this law. Jessica? Hi, thank you, Anna, and thanks uh, for hosting this, this call um, with the Western Center and other people on the call. Um, go ahead and advance the slide. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here is our experience in repealing what we call the maximum family grant rule, which is California's family cap. Um, and I tell you the name just because it was important for us to be able to, um, to link the campaign across four different years uh, in which we pursued the repeal. Um, and if you're interested in following that campaign, there is a Facebook page uh, about the MFG repeal, and also um, hashtag repeal MFG. Um, and just as a reminder for people following along today, the hashtag for today's webinar is end tennis cap. So, um, so our family cap rule um, was in place and it had been passed on the floor of the Senate and the Assembly in actually on July 4th of 1994. Um, and it wasn't implemented until after TANF um, was implemented in 1997. The reason for that is because uh, in order to uh, to use the TANF family cap here in California, we had to get approval from the, the federal administrators. And, um, and administrators here in California refused to comply with some of the requirements of, of that waiver, which would have required um, additional evaluation of the rule to see if it had a, a negative impact on the well-being of children, and also to not implement the rule in a way that would impact teen parents. And um, here in California, the administrators refused to comply with those and so had to wait until we got the family, until we had a, a TANF block grant in order to implement the rule. What this rule did here in California was it denied $130, roughly, you know, some months or some years it was a little bit less, some years it was a little bit more, but roughly $130 a month um, for a child. Based on basically based on when the child was conceived, if the child was conceived while the family was on aid, and they didn't have a break in aid uh, for two months or longer during the you know during the time in which the woman was pregnant, then the child, if born, would be denied aid. Um, and if if the child was conceived and born before the family was on aid, then the family would re receive aid for the child. Um, so that's how the rule worked here in California. Um, it increased the poverty, as you heard before, among children by an estimated 13%. Um, but we were able to, to share, as part of this campaign, the negative impacts of deep poverty on children. And, and um, as you heard previously, it's, it can be very harmful for a child. In fact, it's one of the most dangerous places for a child to be, is underneath half of the federal poverty line. We also found that uh, um, some of the stories that, that people told uh, very brave clients, that uh, Calvary clients that came forward, 
um, to tell their stories. Um, this interfered with family reproductive decisions and privacy. Um, it also, we had uh, workers who worked uh, in the county human services agencies to provide cow work, uh, told stories about how embarrassing and humiliating it was for them as workers to have to ask some of the, the difficult questions that the law required. Um, our law specifically gave some exemptions to people if they um, had conceived the child as a result of, of rape, uh, or if the child was conceived as a result of um, a failed type of permanent contraceptions that were named in the law as sterilization um, and IUD, for example. And this, what this meant is that um, economic caseworkers were asking questions of parents when they came in how a child was conceived uh, for proof of rape um, and for other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, verification, for example, from a doctor that you were sterilized and the sterilization didn't work. Um, and as you can imagine, these, these notes from doctors were really hard to obtain. And the questions, again, very um, intrusive into private uh, decision making of parents. And finally, it undermined the poverty fighting goals of TANF. The goal of the program is to prevent harm for children and families and to create opportunity. And we had parents who testified that in, indeed the rule um, prevented them from becoming housed, prevented them from being able to exit poverty um, as quickly as they would like. So the, the overall result, you know, of course, was that more children were living in deep poverty in California and that their families were more likely to stay in poverty and less likely to escape it. Next slide, please. So um, here in California, I want to start just briefly by saying, you know, as you can see on the screen, the kind of various efforts, multi-year efforts, um, to repeal uh, the rule, the maximum family grant rule, our family cap. Um, but before all of this, the year before the bill, uh, uh, our first bill was introduced, Assembly Bill 271 by Senator Holly Mitchell, a great champion uh, for this issue. The, um, the Women's Law Center, the National Women's Law Center, had highlighted an effort uh, to stop the establishment of a new family cap in Pennsylvania. Their coverage of that fight and the very swift victory um, to stop an effort to establish a new family cap in that state inspired California. And I say this because um, it's one of our hopes today that there'll be states and advocates listening in um, who maybe have given up, like California had, on a repeal of the family cap. You know, the efforts to repeal the family cap hadn't been introduced in the legislature for several years uh, before um, AB 271 was introduced. And this was really largely as a result of, of us as advocates not seeing a path forward. The victory to stop an effort to establish a new family cap in Pennsylvania inspired us to try again. Um, and so I think that's important to say and, I, and, uh, and to think about that even in um, really harsh uh, political climate, um, efforts to stop something bad from happening or to even just to inch forward in, um, in small victories um, can be inspirational to a bigger effort and to a sustained um, and coordinated campaign. So thank you for that. So here in California, as I said, we, uh, our first bill was introduced, um, AB 271 in 2012 uh, by Senator Mitchell. And we had a, a kind of small group of coalition members and we began um, with a great support of the Women's Policy Institute uh, run by our Women's Foundation out here. Um, the, 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 the effort made it, uh, the bill made it through to the second house, but we did not, um, did not pass through the final appropriations committee. Uh, the next year, Senator Mitchell was then a senator and she introduced AB 899. Um, again, uh, the bill um, did not move forward to the governor's office. The following year was the, the beginning of a, a second two-year cycle, and SB 23, Senator Mitchell introduced again the same exact bill, a bill to repeal the rules and not replace it, not partially repeal it, but to repeal it. Um, and that bill made it all the way to the, the floor of the second house. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that by then we had built up a, a pretty large campaign and the coalition members were as diverse as you can imagine. 
uh, it probably this bill was probably one of the only efforts in the state legislative history that had both reproductive justice communities and Planned Parenthood uh, communities as well as the California Catholic Conference um, on in support and making it a top priority bill in their state legislative days. Uh, we had over 200 organizations uh, who had signed on in support and, and the coalition was large and robust. We also had bipartisan support uh, it, and a strong women's caucus support in the Senate when the bill uh, was on the floor. Not a single woman voted against the bill. So even this, uh, a, a Senate, and we had some bipartisanship uh, where some uh, women senators who were um, Republican and Democrat voted for the bill, but, but not a single woman voted against the bill, and that's important to know. Um, but it wasn't until we were able to get it into the budget committee that we signed it, uh, the final victory here, um, and it was a two-year kind of uh, stutter step where um, in 2015 we got it all the way down to the governor's office and lost it in the final negotiations with the governor, and it finally passed July 7th, or sorry, July of uh, 2016. Um, the bill has now be, been implemented, and as of, July, or as of January 1, 2017, no child has is now is is denied aid because of the date of their conception, uh, whether or not their families were on aid when they were conceived and born. Um, and to us, this is not just a victory of public policy and good um, research, right, which shows that the intent of the policy does, was never even achieved. But it's also a victory of broad coalition. It's a victory of of humanity really, and um, of all the things that we say we believe in, in California and the country, that every child should have the opportunity to succeed. Um, an acknowledgement that when they're denied aid um, from the very beginning, because of how they were conceived, we actually aren't achieving that goal. Um, and so that's why I'm really proud as an anti-poverty advocate um, and as a as a person who experienced uh, hunger and poverty as a child, that this policy uh, represents something much bigger um, about what, how we believe in children and, and why they're important. Um, next slide, please. This is just a list. I, I wanted to provide you a list of all the people that were in support, the diversity of, um, of the community, and it's also really important, as you heard before from Jill, the reproductive justice community was uh, very present. And you can see many different organizations from that community uh, represented here. Um, and their voice was especially helpful because um, we were able to talk about what does reproductive justice mean within uh, California and for poor women. We were able to address stereotypes, as you heard before, about women, women of color, and recipients of public welfare benefits. Um, so over over 100 organizations uh, stayed into the campaign for for two years, and this is who they are. Next slide, please. So again, as I said before, um, we are we can say here in California that children are no longer denied aid because they were conceived and born while poor, and this is 130,000 children who are now valued the same as other children in the program. Um, and with that, we are uh, on through to the end of my slide. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, at this time, I believe we are going to um, go to questions and answers. Um, so as a reminder, if you have um, any questions, you can enter them into your webinar toolbar. Um, and Jillian here from the National Women's Law Center is going to be moderating the Q&A. Um, so I know that there was one question that came in during the presentation about whether or not we can share the, um, the maps. Um, so just a note that we will be um, sharing the, um, the webinar recording as well as the slides, the link to the PowerPoints as well as um, the report that was mentioned and other resources um, in a day or two after this webinar. So you should have all of those delivered directly to your inbox. Um, if folks have other questions, it looks like some things are still rolling in, so I don't know um, 
if there were other points that any of our presenters wanted to make. Um, I think we had a question for Jessica um, from the Western Center on Law and Poverty. We wanted to know how did you recruit all of the groups that you had on that slide? You had a lot of groups who were involved in this issue, and how did you recruit them uh, to this really important issue? Um, well, one of the things I think really helped was uh, was our champion, Senator Holly Mitchell. Um, she was instrumental and inspiring. Um, when we first began the campaign, we didn't really um, we hadn't really planned out or talked much about race and uh, the impact of race on on the on the law being implemented in the first place. Uh, and Senator Mitchell led us into that conversation very early on. She called the policy for what it was, um, a, you know, a policy based on a racist, classist stereotype of welfare recipient. Um, and, and she kind of declared that this so was. Uh, one of the ways in which we needed to repeal the myth of the welfare queen. Um, her, you know, what I find, I've worked with a lot of coalitions on, and on a lot of legislative campaigns, and what I find is um, similar among all of them is um, a leader who can tell the truth, um, can stick uh, with the policy. Um, there was no point at which Senator Mitchell wavered on the fact that the policy needed to be repealed. Um, not changed, not made less softer, but that the, it was actually based on a false myth, that the science and um, all the research and studies show that they didn't achieve the goals that they said that they were going to achieve, um, and, that the, and that the outcomes were so harmful for poor kids. Um, and, and so I think the leadership of Senator Mitchell really helped to recruit a broad-based uh, group of people. Um, but also, you know, I think um, the other thing that really helps, because as you can see, um, there are people from all different sides of, of the coin here, um, reminding everybody that this is about children. Um, you know, you heard Alison Weir talk from the National Diaper Bank Network uh, about unmet diaper needs. Um, you know, being able to talk about what does it mean to be a child living in deep poverty, not just the statistics, not just the charts that show that they have less opportunity, but why do they have less opportunity? Because uh, because they're suffering with lack of basic needs, very basic needs that every child needs. So why would we deny uh, di you know, the money is needed for diapers for a child born into deep poverty? Um, so always bringing it back to the kid I think really helped, and it helped us bring on the diverse group of people um, that we had. And finally, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't give up. Um, and, and it was important that at the end of each year, I mean, I have to say, like at the end of each year when we lost, the, the desire to give up and just walk away um, from the campaign, even though we knew it was right, because we heard we didn't feel like the legislature or the governor um, were moving uh, with us in, in the repeal as fast as we needed them to. It, it was, um, you know, it was really hard to keep going every year. Um, but our commitment to stick with it, I think, um, at, at, by the fourth year, people were ready to get up and start fighting again the day after we lost. Um, and so that was really important too, just sending the message that we're not going away. We're going to stay here until we get this. We know that we're right. Um, and as a campaign, we, uh, we all understood that, that uh, if you're right, um, it doesn't matter how many times you lose, you have to keep going. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question. Uh, for you as well about whether or not social media efforts were effective with this campaign and how was social media used in the campaign? Um, every, you know, we've actually gotten whole news stories out of Sacramento, our state capital, about our social media campaign, which was pretty simple. It wasn't this big, you know, funded thing. Um, we had a hashtag, the TLMFG, which kept us all together. Um, we used the hashtag to, uh, to you know, pull together the, the coalition of members, um, but also to kind of call out the issue in budget dialogue and, um, and to tag specific members. The members knew uh, if, if they were going to support the policy that there would be a huge uh, group of people on social media that would respond positively. Um, so, you know, the Women's Caucus, when they all voted in favor of the bill or, or uh, refused to vote opposing it, 
um, there was a huge splash of, of recognition. Um, and so it became kind of the underdog fight of, uh, of the capital social media um, community uh, that, that people always wanted to know what was happening. And all, all you had to do to find out was to, to enter hashtag repeal MFC and you could find out the latest news. Um, so absolutely, social media was important. And moving forward, um, you know, I've been contacted by several states. There's uh, a repeal effort now in New Jersey, another one in Massachusetts. Um, and those states have found our documentation of all the coverage, um, the hearings, um, the historical references uh, to the policy, all located on our Facebook page. And it's just been easy to share those materials and resources with other states moving forward as well. Jess, this is Jill. Yeah. I was hoping I could chi chime in yeah. on, on that question. Um, so I know I didn't mention this in the, in the comments, but I had the pleasure of working with Jess and our other colleagues to repeal the MFG rule in California. And um, in addition to the social media, there were also uh, a variety of blogs and letters to the editor and op-eds uh, year after year that were the product of some, or the, the, the mind product of some really tremendous organizers and very effective communications experts who were part of this campaign at various points, including Chanel Matthews, who now runs uh, communications for Black Lives Matter. So um, there were some really effective very thorough communication strategies underway. And then to the earlier question about how, how was such a broad-based diverse coalition built, and I completely agree with Jess about uh, Senator Holly Mitchell's um, just stalwart advocacy and, and appeal. And um, I would also say, you know, the reproductive health rights and justice movement in California is very well connected and organized through the California Coalition for Reproductive Freedom. It's, it's a network of over 40 different organizations. And um, you know, while it typically doesn't take positions on policy, it has an annual lobby day and, and it prioritized the repeal of the maximum family grant rule a couple of times, as did you know, the majority of the organizations in it. And then uh, I also wanted to lift up the work of the reproductive justice organizations um, that were so uh, that were you know at the um, at the vanguard of this repeal effort year after year, including Access Women Health Women's Health Justice and California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. Um, you know, from the reproductive justice ideology, approaching this work um, from an intersectional standpoint and doing uh, doing some of that work to reach out to other groups uh, with other priority issues um, and build it, helping, uh, as did the anti-poverty and, and economic justice groups, to build a truly multiracial, multi-generational, multi-class, and multi-issue coalition uh, in support of the repeal. And this is Jess. I would, I would underscore what you said and, and say, kind of in a, in a broad umbrella kind of way, the campaign wasn't, it, it didn't come to the community. It came from the community. And, um, and, it, and it grew, you know, the, um, we all grew uh, in our understanding of each other. It was a coalition of coalitions. We, we, uh, we made sure that the campaign reflected the language and the learning um, done in those, in those communities and in those coalitions so that, um, we, we learned each other's language. You know, how do you talk about poverty in ways that reflect how poor people and people who organize poor people talk about poverty? How do you talk about reproductive justice um, in ways that are exactly similar and parallel to the ways in which the mostly black and Latina and women of color who are, uh, women of color who are leading the reproductive justice community efforts, um, how do you have a campaign that reflects those conversations, you make sure that the coalition um, it includes those leaders um, from the beginning. And that's, and that's why I think we can say we're proud about the campaign. I know I personally grew a lot um, and learned a lot from the people I worked with in the campaign and, and will never be the same because of it in very positive ways. This is Elizabeth. I'd love to, oh, hi, jump in. Sorry. Just building on that, that 
even if you don't think this is a fight that you can win this year, I think it's worth starting the conversation and building the campaign, both because, as just noted, sometimes you have to fight it over many years in order to win. But also, it's really a conversation that I think builds your strengths and your understanding, both these relationships across organizations, but also it's the conversation that you want to be having about CANF. It's that this is a program designed to help very low-income families of children, and instead of helping people get a head start, we're holding them back. And isn't that what this program is supposed to prevent? So I think it's a conversation that moves the people's understanding of the programs and their relationships forward. Um, and a lot of times we wind up having conversations that we're really on the defensive, and this is one we can win. I wholeheartedly agree. I think that was fantastic. And you know, I think what's very interesting here about the California experience is the wide range of advocates that you all were able to bring to come to the table to attack this from multiple different angles and talk about the different overlapping and intersectional impacts of this claim. Um, so I was just wondering if Jessica and Jill may be able to share some of the messaging you know, that they use to appeal to the different sectors you know, and to the different people and advocates at the root table? Well, one of the early, um, at, you know, as Jill said, Chanel Matthews, who's now with Black Lives Matter, um, is, is um, fantastic if you ever get a chance to, to work with her. One of the early lessons we all learned together as a coalition was, you know, ha how to talk about children. Um, and, you know, we had some, some great consultants that were brought in uh, thanks to the Women's um, Foundation here in California that helped us to support a, a day kind of retreat where we talked about um, the messaging around children in poverty um, and and how to not shy away from tough conversations, right? In the beginning, we started to talk about the, the campaign as a way to invest in children and, um, and, and had kind of the reproductive justice and privacy issues as secondary. Um, as I said before, we weren't really talking about race and its relationships to the rule. Um, and you know, and, and because of that, like we felt like we weren't getting we weren't getting traction. Um, and what we realized is we just we really had to claim the space uh, that um, this isn't really about whether or not children make good workers in the future. This is really about the rights of children to not live with pain and suffering uh, from unmet basic, uh, unmet basic needs. This is really about what lives children have um, when they're living in deep poverty. And we need to be able to talk about that and be honest about it. And uh, we need to be able to talk about the racist classes, misogynistic origins of the rule, and to understand um, why they were made and what they mean today, um, and to call them out. And what we found was that the more honest we were uh, about what we all knew to be true about the rule, and um, more honest that we were about um, the experience of children and families, and the more we pushed forward the voices of families um, as, as their own spokespeople in the hearings, in, as Joe said before, in blogs, um, it, through petitions. One, one person who was impacted by the rule put a, a petition out with 7,000 signatures and delivered it herself to the governor's office, um, Vivian Hain, and an incredible advocate um, who stuck with it for years in opposition to the rule. Um, so this was this was an important lesson that we learned there, you know, early in the campaign and, and it, when we could feel the campaign turn and um, the more honest we became about about the, these laws and how they impact families. So I don't know if you want to add anything. The only thing I would add is that we were not mild or meek about it. Um, like Jess said, the, the more honest we were, when we called this out as abhorrent, as embarrassing, as a shame for this state that holds itself up as a, you know, a, a leader in reproductive um, rights policy, the more we saw that reflected um, by you know, editors at major news outlets and eventually by elected officials. So in a very short amount of years, we saw, you know, we saw elected officials sort of reluctantly giving their I vote in committee hearings to the point where, uh, as just mentioned, Republican elected officials 
were chiming in to pontificate about how terrible and shameful this law is in those committee meetings. So we kind of created this drumbeat um, about just how bad and how unthinkable it is that we would continue to, to perpetuate uh, this policy. Thank you. Um, that was our last question that we have, um, but if anybody has questions afterwards, we did have the contact information for our panelists, and then you can also send them to us, and we will send them out with the slides and the other um, information that will be included with our follow-up to this webinar. And Amanda, if you would like to close us out. Great, thank you. Um, thank you again to our incredible panel of experts um, for all of your informative presentations today, and thank you um, to everyone for joining us. Um, we will send the link out soon with all the resources and the webinar slides um, so that you can revisit them, share them with colleagues um, as needed. Um, and with that, that concludes today's webinar. So thank you all very much, and have a good day.